Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. Today, my guest is Dr. Aaliyah Crum. Dr. Crum is a tenured professor of psychology at Stanford University and the founder and director of the Stanford Mind and Body Lab. Her work focuses on mindsets, how what we think and what we believe shapes the way that our physiology, our biology reacts to things like what we eat or stress or exercise. Indeed, as you will soon learn from my discussion with Dr. Crum, what you believe about the nutritional content of your food changes the way that food impacts your brain and body to a remarkable degree. And the same is true for mindsets about exercise and stress and even medication. For instance, recent work from Dr. Crum's laboratory shows that what we believe about the side effect profiles of different drug treatments or different behavioral treatments has a profound impact on how quickly those treatments work and the effectiveness of those treatments. I just want to mention one particular study that just came out from a graduate student in Dr. Crum's laboratory, Lauren Howe, H-O-W-E, showed that how kids react to a treatment for peanut allergies can be profoundly shaped by whether or not those kids were educated about the side effects of the treatment, such that if they learned that the side effects were a byproduct of a treatment that would help them, and they learned a little bit about why those side effects arose and that the side effects might even help them en route to overcoming their peanut allergy, had an enormous impact on how quickly they moved through the treatment and indeed how much they suffered or in this case did not suffer from those side effects. And that is but one example that you will learn about today as we discuss what mindsets are, the number of different mindsets that exist and how we can adopt mindsets that make us more adaptive, more effective, allow us to suffer less and to perform better in all aspects of life. I personally find the work of Dr. Aaliyah Crum to be among the most important work being done in the fields of biology and psychology and the interface of mind-body. Everything that she's done up until now and published and indeed the work that she continues to do has shaped everything within my daily routines, within my work routines, within my athletic routines. And we probably shouldn't be surprised by the fact that Dr. Crum works on all these things. She was not only an incredibly accomplished tenured research professor, she's also a clinical psychologist, and she was also a division one athlete and an elite gymnast at one period in her life. So she really walks the walk uh, in terms of understanding what mindsets are and applying them in different aspects of life. I'm sure you're going to learn a ton from this conversation, as did I, and come away with many, many actionable items that you can apply in your own life. In fact, as we march into today's conversation, you might want to just put in the back of your mind the question, what is my mindset about blank? So for instance, ask yourself, what is my mindset about stress? What is my mindset about food? What is my mindset about exercise? What is my mindset about relationships of different kinds? Because in doing that, you'll be in a great position to extract the best of the information that Dr. Crum presents and indeed to adapt those mindsets in the way that is going to be most beneficial for you. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Thesis. Thesis makes custom nootropics that are ideal for the particular brain states that you want to be in. The term nootropic means smart drug, and it is not a term that I like because there's no such thing as a universally useful smart drug. The reason for that is that our brain can be creative, we can be focused, we can be good at task switching, and each of those different things, creativity, focus, and task switching, involves different neurochemicals in different states of mind and body. So the notion that there's one best nootropic is just not accurate. There's just no way that could possibly be. Thesis understands this, and for that reason, designs custom nootropics that are designed to bring your brain and body into the states that you want and that are specifically designed to your neurochemistry. They use only the highest quality ingredients, many of which I've talked about before on the podcast. Things like DHA, ginkgo biloba, phosphatidylsterine, alpha-GPC is one that I particularly like and is in several of the formulations that are customized for me. However, ginkgo biloba, which has a lot of research to support it and is well tolerated by many people, doesn't work well for me. It actually gives me headaches. So it, that one is not included in any of the custom formulations that Thesis has made particularly for me. Thesis has this tremendous asset, which is that they give you the ability to try several different blends over the course of a month and discover which nootropics work best for your unique brain chemistry and genetics. So the formulas that work for me may not be the best ones for you and vice versa. 
But in a short period of time, you can dial in the exact nootropic formulas for the states of mind and body that you want to be in. I've been using Thesis for close to six months now, and I can confidently say that their nootropics have been a total game changer. I love the motivation formula. I also like the energy formula. I use those for different things, it turns out, but I love those. And I use their logic formula and their clarity formula that they've customized for me. In addition to their personalization, Thesis takes it a step further. They'll offer you a free consultation with a brain coach to help optimize your experience with the nootropics and dial in the best formulas for you. To get your own personalized nootropic starter kit, go online to takethesis.com slash Huberman, take their brief three-minute quiz, and Thesis will send you four different formulas to try in your first month. That's takethesis.com slash Huberman, and use the code Huberman at checkout to get 10% off your first box. Today's episode is also brought to us by Roka. Roka makes eyeglasses and sunglasses that are of the absolute highest quality. I've spent a lifetime working on the visual system, and I can tell you that our visual system has to contend with a huge number of different challenges, not the least of which is when we go from a very bright, sunny spot outside into the shade, our visual system has to adapt in order for us to continue to see clearly. Many sunglasses out there just don't allow that adaptation to occur in a seamless way. Roka eyeglasses and sunglasses are designed with all of the biology of the visual system in mind so that you always see things with crystal clarity, no matter what environment you're in. They also have a terrific aesthetic. They have many, many different styles to choose from. So their eyeglasses can be worn to dinner or out to lunch or to work. Their sunglasses can be worn essentially anywhere. They're very stylish and they were designed for performance. They won't slip off your face if you get sweaty. Indeed, you can wear them while running or while cycling. They're really terrific. They're really versatile. If you'd like to try Roka glasses, go to Roka, that's R-O-K-A dot com and enter the code Huberman to save 20% off your first order. Again, that's Roka, R-O-K-A dot com and enter the code Huberman at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to us by Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better meet your immediate and long-term health goals. I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done for the simple reason that many of the things that impact your immediate and long-term health can only be assessed from a quality blood test. And nowadays with the advent of modern DNA tests, you can also get a window into how your genes are impacting your health in the short and long term and the various things that you should do in order to adjust your health in the right direction. Now, one of the major issues with a lot of blood tests and DNA tests out there is you get numbers back and you learn whether or not your lipids or your hormones, et cetera, are within the proper range or not. But there aren't a lot of directives about what to do with that information. Inside Tracker makes all of that very easy. They have a personalized dashboard that allows you to, of course, see the numbers that come back to you and to make various changes in nutrition, various changes in exercise, various changes in all sorts of lifestyle factors that can bring those numbers into range. And so if you have a particular value for a particular metabolic factor or hormone or so forth, you click on that and it will actually bring up the full menu of things that you can do in order to adjust that factor into the ranges that you like, all based on quality peer-reviewed research. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can visit insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 25% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Just use the code Huberman at checkout. And now... My conversation with Dr. Aliyah Crum. Well, great to have you here. <laughs> great to be here. Yeah. For the record, it's Aliyah Crum, but you go by Ali, correct? That is, that okay. is correct. Right. Dr. Yeah. Ali Crum. <laughs> or just be. Ali. Okay. Great. Well, I've been looking forward to talking to you for a long time. Just to start off, you know, you've talked a lot and worked a lot on the science of mindsets. Could you define for us what is a mindset and what sort of purpose does it serve? Of course. Yeah. Mindsets have been described or defined in a lot of ways. We define mindsets as core beliefs or assumptions that we have about a domain or category of things that orient us to a particular set of expectations, explanations, and goals. So that's kind of jargony. <laughs> I can, a little, I can uh, distill it down for you. So mindsets are an assumption that you make about a domain. So take stress, for example, the nature of stress. What's your sort of core belief about that? And mindsets that we've studied about stress are, do you view stress as enhancing good for you or do you view it as debilitating and bad for you? Those mindsets, those core beliefs orient our thinking. They change what we expect will happen to us when we're stressed how we explain the occurrences that happen or unfold when we're stressed, and also change our motivation for what we engage in when we're stressed. 
Uh, so we have mindsets about many things, mindsets about stress, mindsets about intelligence, as Carol Dweck's work has shown, mindsets about food, mindsets about medicine, you name it. Uh, it's sort of distilling down those core assumptions that really shape and orient our thinking and action. I've heard you say before that mindsets simplify life in some way by constraining the number of things that we have to consider. Um, and it sounds to me like we can have mindsets about many things, as, as you said. What are some different mindsets? I think uh, many people are familiar with our colleague Carol Dweck's um, notion of growth mindset, that if we're not proficient at something that uh, we should think about not being proficient yet, that we are on some path to proficiency. But what are some examples of mindsets um, and how early do these get laid down or do we learn them from our parents? So maybe um, if you could just um, flesh it out a bit for us in terms of what you've, what you've observed in your own science or your own life even. Yeah, sure. So I think it's important with, with Carol Dweck's work, a lot of people kind of get focused on growth motivation and all these things, but her work really originated from thinking about what she called as implicit theories or core beliefs about the nature of intelligence or ability. Right, so do you believe that your baseline levels of intelligence or your abilities are fixed, static, set throughout the rest of your life? Or do you believe that they can grow and change? Now, those are oversimplified <laughs> generalizations about the nature of intelligence. And the reality is, as it always is, complex, and it's a bit of both, and it's all these things. But as humans, we need these simplifying systems to help us understand a complex reality. So those assumptions that we jump to, oh, intelligence is fixed or intelligence is malleable, um, they help us to simplify this complex reality, but they're not inconse inconsequential, right? They, they matter in shaping our motivation. And as she has shown, if you have the mindset that intelligence is malleable, you're motivated to work harder to grow your intelligence. If you have a setback in your learning, you think, okay, there's something there that I can grow and learn and build from. If you have the mindset that it's fixed, you know, why work harder at math if you don't think you're good at it? So, it, you know, in retrospect, it's pretty clear how these mindsets can affect our motivation. What our work has aimed to do is to expand the range of mindsets that we are uh, studying, <laughs> focused on, and also understand and expand the range of effects that they have. So by and large, we focused on mindsets in the domain of health and health behaviors. Uh, so I mentioned you know, mindsets about stress. We've also looked at mindsets about food and healthy eating. So do you have the mindset that foods that are good for you, healthy foods, are disgusting and depriving? Or do you have the mindset that healthy foods are indulgent and delicious? Now, you know, it could be a variety of different foods. You might have different thoughts about different healthy foods. But generally, people, at least in our culture in, in the West, have this view that stress is debilitating, healthy foods are disgusting and depriving. And those mindsets, whether or not they're true or false, right or wrong, they have an impact. And they have an impact not just through the motivational mechanisms that Dweck and others have studied, but as our lab has started to reveal, they also shape physiological mechanisms by changing what our bodies prioritize and prepare to do. Uh, so those are just two examples, mm -hmm. mindsets about stress, mindsets about food. We've looked at mindsets about exercise. Do you feel like you're getting enough or do you feel like you're getting an insufficient amount to get the health? benefits you're seeking. Uh, mindsets about illness. Do you view cancer as an unmitigated catastrophe? Or do you view cancer as manageable or perhaps even, even an opportunity? Uh, we've looked at mindsets about symptoms and side effects. Do you view side effects as you know, a sign that the treatment is, is harmful? Or do you view side effects as a sign that the treatment is working? Again, these are sort of core beliefs or assumptions you have about these domains or categories, uh, but they matter because they're shaping, they're synthesizing and simplifying the way we're thinking, but they're also shaping what we're paying attention to, what we're motivated to do, and potentially even how our bodies respond. Yeah, um, I'd love to talk about this notion of how our uh, the mindset shaping how our bodies respond. And uh, maybe as an example of this, if you could share with us this uh, now famous study that uh, you're, uh, you've done with a milkshake study, 
if you um, wouldn't mind sharing the major you know, contours of that study and the results, because I think they're extremely impressive and they really speak to this interplay between mindset and physiology. Certainly, yeah. This was a study that I ran as a graduate student at Yale University. I was working with Kelly Brownell and Peter Salovey. Peter Salovey had done a lot of work on really coining the term emotional intelligence. He's now the that. president of Yale, He's now right? the president of okay. Yale, yes. So he's done well. He's, yeah. he's done well yeah. for himself and for the university and society. Uh, and Kelly Brownell, who was doing a lot of research on food and obesity, and I had come in doing some previous work on mindsets about exercise and placebo effects in exercise and was in this sort of food domain and this emotions and food domain. And it really occurred to me that there was a very simple question that hadn't been probed yet. And that was, do our beliefs about what we're eating change our body's physiological response to that food, holding constant the objective nutrients of that thing? So that question might sound outrageous at first, but it was it's really not outrageous if you're coming from a place of having studied in depth placebo effects. <laughs> placebo effects are this, ro in medicine at least, are this sort of robust dem demonstration in which simply taking a sugar pill, taking nothing, under the impression that it's a real medication that might relieve your asthma, reduce your blood pressure, boost your immune system, can lead to those physiological effects, even though there's no objective nutrients. And we have more evidence on placebo effects than we have for any other drug <laughs> because, really? of, because of the clinical trial mm -hmm. process in which all new drugs and medication are, medications are required to outperform a placebo effect. So we have a lot of data on the placebo effect. Now, you know, we can get nuanced there. We don't have a lot of data comparing the placebo effect to doing nothing, uh, which is important for distilling mindset effects or belief effects from sort of natural occurring changes in the body. But anyways, going back to this question, it was like, all right, we've moved from, you know, medications solving our health crises to behavioral medicine solving our health crises, increase people's exercise, get them to eat better. To what degree are these things influenced by our mindsets or beliefs about them? So to test this question, we ran a seemingly simple study. This was done at the Yale Center for um, Clinical and Translational Research. And we brought people into our lab under the impression that we were designing different milkshakes with vastly different metabolic concentrations, nutrient concentrations, um, that were designed to meet different metabolic needs of the patrons of the hospital, right? So you're going to come in, you're going to taste these milkshakes, and we're going to measure your body's physiological response to them. This was a within-subjects design, so it was the same people uh, consuming two different milkshakes, two different time points separated by a week. And at one time point, they were told that they were consuming this really high-fat, high-caloric indulgent milkshake. It was like a 620 calorie, super high fat and sugar. The other time point, they were told that it was a low fat, low calorie, sensible sort of diet shake. In reality, it was the exact same shake. It was right in the middle. It was like 300 calories, moderate amount of fats and sugars. And we were measuring their body's gut peptide response to this shake. And in particular, we were looking at the hormone ghrelin. So as you know, ghrelin uh, hunger, uh, medical experts call it the hunger hormone, rises in ghrelin, signal, you know, seek out food. Uh, and then theoretically, in proportion to the amount of calories you consume, ghrelin levels drop, signaling to the brain, okay, you don't, you, can, you don't need to eat so much anymore, you can stop eating, and also revving up the metabolism to burn the nutrients that were just ingested. What we found in this study was that when people thought they were consuming the high-fat, high-calorie indulgent milkshake, in response to the shake, their ghrelin levels dropped at a threefold rate <laughs> stronger than when they thought they were consuming the sensible shake. So essentially, their bodies responded as if they had consumed more food, even though it was the exact sh same shake at both time points. So this was really, you know, uh, interesting and important uh, for two reasons, really. One was that it was, to my knowledge, one of the first studies to show any effects of just believing that you're eating something different on your physiology. Lots of studies have, sh have shown that 
believing you're eating different things changes your taste, you know, and your even your satisfaction and fullness after. But this shows that it has a metabolic or a physiological component. Um, but the second piece was really important as well, uh, and especially for me, this was one study that really transformed the way I think about how I approach eating, and that was the manner in which it affected our physiology was somewhat counterintuitive. So I had gone in thinking the better mindset to be in when you eat is that you're eating healthy, right? Like, you know, it just makes sense. Like placebo effects, think you're healthy, you'll be healthy, you know? But that was a far too simplistic way of thinking about it. And in fact, it was the exact opposite because thinking that they were eating, when these uh, participants thought they were eating sensibly, their bodies left them still feeling physiologically hungry, right? Not satiated which could potentially be corresponding to slower metabolism and so forth. So if you're in the interest of maintaining or losing weight, (laughs) what's the best mindset to be in? It's to be in a mindset that you're eating indulgently, that you're having enough food, that you're getting enough. Um, And at least in that study we showed that has a, a more adaptive effect on ghrelin responses. So interesting. And especially interesting to me as a neuroscientist who has worked on aspects of the nervous system that are involved in conscious perception, like vision and, you know, motion and color perception and so forth. But also our lab has worked um, and is increasingly working on autonomic functions that are below our conscious detection. Mm-hmm. In this case, a, a a lie about how much something uh, uh, these milkshakes contain affected a subconscious process, because I have to imagine that the ghrelin pathway is not one that I can decide, oh, you know, this uh, particular piece of chocolate is going to really reduce my ghrelin because it's very nutrient rich, as opposed to one, if you told me that a different piece of chocolate, for instance, is uh, low calorie or or sugar-free chocolate or something of that sort. The ghrelin pathway, however, it seems, based on your data, that the ghrelin pathway is susceptible to thoughts, which is incredible. But then again, there must be crossover between conscious thought and these subconscious or kind of autonomic pathways. So it's really remarkable. Uh, It raises a question that um, uh, I just have to ask because increasingly so I'm uh, involved in, you know, online discussions and, you know, social media. And one of the most barbed wire topics out there, and that's being generous, is this topic of which diet mm-hmm. or nutrients are best. You've got people who are strictly plant-based. Um, you've got people who are omnivores. You've got people who are carnivores. You have every variation. You have intermittent fasting, also called time-restricted feeding. And it seems like once a group kind of plugs into uh, a particular mode of eating that they feel works for them, for whatever reason, energy-wise, mentally, maybe they're looking at their blood profiles, maybe they're not. But once they feel that it's sort of... Um, it works for them. Each camp seems to tout all the health benefits and how great they feel. Could it be that mindset effects are involved there, that people are finding the nutritional program that they feel brings them the most um, enrichment of life, but also nutrients, and that their health really is shifting in a positive direction, but not necessarily because of the food constituents, but because of the community and the ideas and the reinforcement. Yeah, and the belief that Mm -hmm. this is the right way of doing something. I, I think 100%, I, 100% it has something to contribute. You know, I don't want to, I'm not going to weigh in on the debate, no, <laughs> which but, is better. It, what I will most certainly weigh in on is, is the notion that, look, going back to the placebo effect, right, we have an outdated understanding of what that is, which is based on this randomized control trial. You compare a drug to a placebo. If the drug works better than the placebo, you say, great, the drug works. If the drug doesn't outperform the placebo, you say the drug doesn't work. That's really oversimplified. It's a good test for the specific efficacy of the drug. It's not a good test for understanding the total impact of that drug. Because in the reality of things, you know, if a drug outperforms a placebo, then, you know, you start prescribing it. But you, the reality is that the total effect of that drug is a combined product of the specific chemical you know, attributes of that drug and whatever's going on in the placebo effect, which is, you know, at least from our perspective, it's beliefs, it's social context, and it's your body's natural ability to respond to something. So you know, that's in the placebo effect example. The same is true for 
everything we do or consume. So when it comes to what diet you're, you're eating, um, both are true. It does matter what it is, and it matters what you think about that diet and what others around you and in our culture think about that diet because those social contexts inform our mindsets. Our mindsets interact with our physiology in ways that produce outcomes that are really important. So let's not get dualistic and say, you know, it's either all in the mind or not in the mind. Let's also not be unnecessarily combative and say, oh, it should be all plant-based or, you know, keto or whatever. It's all of those things are a combined product of what you're actually doing and what you're thinking about. If you believe in it, if you don't, if you're skeptical or you know, in some cases, you think you should be eating, eating a certain way and then you don't live up to that, it might have a, even an adverse effect because of the, the stress and the anxiety associated with that. Very interesting. Um, along the lines of belief effects, is that, can we call these belief effects sure. or mindsets? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there a difference between these, uh, what I'm calling belief effects, and placebo effects? I mean, are placebo effects distinctly different from mindset effects or are they more or less the same thing? They're, they're related. So I think placebo effects, you know, maybe should be reserved for the, you know, <laughs> conditions in which you're actually taking a placebo, which is a inactive substance. When you get out of that sort of placebo versus drug, you know, realm and you start looking at, you know, placebo <laughs> effects, I use quotes with my hands here, in behavioral health, it, the term kind of becomes confusing because you're not, you know, in the milkshake study, we didn't give people a placebo milkshake, right? We just changed what they believed about it. So how I like to think about it is that placebo effects, as they're traditionally construed, are made up of three things. It's the social context, mindsets or beliefs, and the natural physiological processes in the brain and body that can produce the outcomes. Um, and so we could just call them belief effects because <laughs> the beliefs are triggering the physiological processes and the beliefs are shaped by the social context. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, there was a paper a year or two ago published in Science, um, Science Magazine about brain regions involved in psychogenic fever mm. that if people or uh, you can actually do this in animal models too, think that they are sick, you get a genuine one to three degree increase in body temperature, three, one to three degrees Fahrenheit increase in body temperature is pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, and I guess plays into, you know, symptomology generally. So I, I'm a believer in belief effects. Well, uh, it's also, and I just say that, you know, the term that we use in the, in our field is nocebo effect for that, which is sort of the placebo's ugly stepsister. <laughs> you know, it's when negative beliefs cause negative consequences. So you are told you will have, you know, it's it's very well demonstrated that when people are told about certain side effects, they're far more likely to experience those side effects. Uh, when people think that they're sick or going to get sick, sometimes that can create, you know, the, the physiological uh, symptoms. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, various debates. That it's not only that physiology changes, it's also that your attention changes. So we're experiencing things like uh, fatigue and headache and upset stomach all the time. And then when you take a drug and somebody says you're going to feel fatigue and headache, you start noticing that you're tired and have headaches and attribute it to the drug. So some of the mechanisms are attention uh, and some of them are real changes in, in physiology. I'd love uh, for you to tell us about... Um the hotel worker study. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know you get asked these questions all the time, but I find these just these results also amazing. Yeah, well. no, I think that this is a really good example of this phenomenon, right? That the total effect of anything is a combined product of what you're doing and what you think about what you're doing. So this was a study that I ran with Ellen Langer way back uh, when I was an undergrad, actually. We started this study Ellen Langer's a professor of psychology at Harvard, and she's done a lot of really fascinating work on her flavor of mindfulness, which is distinct from a more, you know, Eastern um, mind, you know, Buddhist sort of mindfulness-based um, work. And, and she, you know, she actually was the one who said to me originally, 
you know, I was an athlete at the time. I was an ice hockey player, and I was training co constantly. And and one day, I'll never forget it. She said, "You know, you know, the benefit of exercise is just a placebo, right?" And I was like, "Well, that's outrageous." Ellen's 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 known for for saying very provocative, but also very wise things. And that statement really got me thinking about that. So we designed this study together, and that was to look at, you know. How would you study if exercise, the benefits of exercise were a placebo? How would you even test that? Because, you know, what does it mean to give a placebo exercise? So we sort of flipped it on its head and we found a group of people who were getting a lot of exercise, but weren't aware of it that they were, right? So this, we settled on a group of hotel housekeepers. So these were women working in hotels who were on their feet all day long, pushing carts, changing linens climbing stairs, you know, <laughs> cleaning bathrooms, vacuuming. It was clear that they were getting above and beyond at least the Surgeon General's requirements at that time, or, which were to accumulate 30 minutes of moderate physical activity per day. But what was interesting was when we went in and surveyed them and asked them, hey, how much exercise do you think you're getting? A third of them said zero. Like, I don't get any exercise. <laughs> and the average response was like a three on a scale of zero to 10. So it's clear that even though these women were active, they didn't have that mindset, right? They had the mindset that their work was just work, hard, maybe thankless work that led them to feel tired and, and you know, in pain at the end of the day, but not that it was good for them, that it was good exercise. So what we did was we took these women and we randomized them into two groups, and we told half of them that their work was good exercise. This, in this case, it was true, factual information. We oriented them to the Surgeon General's guidelines. We oriented them to the benefits that they should be receiving. And then we had measured them previously on their um, physiological metrics like weight and body fat and blood pressure. And we came back four weeks later and we tested them again. And what we found was that these women, even though they hadn't changed anything in their behavior, at least that was detectable to us, they didn't work more rooms, they didn't start a, you know, doing pull-ups or push-ups in between cleaning hotel rooms as far as I'm concerned, they didn't report any changes in their diet, but they had benefits to their health. So they lost weight they decreased their systolic blood pressure by about 10 points on average, and uh, they started feeling better <laughs> about themselves, them, their bodies, and, and their work, not surprisingly. That's amazing. How should we um, take conceptualize that result in light of um, uh, all of our efforts to get more out of exercise, right? Because earlier you mentioned it from the milkshake study and our perceptions about nutrient density that you know, it's a little bit, the, the right message that actually a little bit counterintuitive that if mm -hmm. you think, oh, this is very uh, low calorie, uh, nutrient sparse, um, then it's good for me in the context of losing weight, for instance. But it turns out the opposite is true because as you, as you told us, the, uh, the body responds differently when you think something is nutrient dense and can actually suppress hunger more. So in, in light of this result, if I were to say, okay, I'm, uh, my current understanding of the of the literature is that getting somewhere between 150 and 180 minutes per week of cardiovascular exercise is probably a good idea for most people. Mm -hmm. If I tell myself that it's not just a good idea, but that it's extremely effective in lowering my blood pressure and maintaining healthy weight, et cetera, et cetera, according to these results, it will have an, an enhanced effect on those metrics. Is that right? Definitely. I, so this is a really important point because what this reveals is that we have to be more thoughtful in how we go about motivating people to exercise or teaching people about the benefits. Uh, our current approach is just to basically tell people writ large, you know, here's what you need to get. Here's what you need to get good for, you know, to get enough benefits to receive the, or enough exercise to receive the health benefits. The problem with that approach is that most people aren't meeting those benefits yet, or aren't meeting those requirements mm -hmm. yet. And the risk with that is that, well, the intention with that is to motivate them because, you know, public health officials think, well, if I just tell people you need to get more exercise because it's good for you, they'll do it. We know now that that doesn't work, that these, these guidelines are not motivational. They don't change our behavior. And what our work adds to that 
is that not only is it not motivational, it also creates potentially a mindset that, you know, makes people worse off (laughs) than they were without knowing about the guidelines. So again, it's tricky. I'm not saying that mindset is everything. Certainly exercise is good for us and use is, is helpful for us. It's one of the things we have the best data on. So I'm not saying, oh, exercise is all a placebo. What I am saying is that we need to be more mindful about how do we motivate people to exercise, but how do we help people to actually reap the benefits of the exercise they are already doing? Now, uh, Octavia Zart, who is a st- uh, grad student in my lab, ran a number of interesting studies along this, uh, these lines, uh, one in which she looked at three nationally representative data sets Uh, which had this interesting question in them, which was, how much exercise do you get relative to others? Do you get about the same, a little more, a lot more? Do you get a little less or a lot less, right? So, you know, the audience, (laughs) your listeners, you could all answer this. And then in these data sets, what she did was she had, you know, pulled from data that tracked death rates over the next 21 years. And a couple interesting things revealed themselves. One was that the correlations between these perceptions of exercise relative to others and people's actual exercise as measured through um, accelerometer uh, data as well as more rigorous sort of what did you do today kind of data, uh, those don't correlate much at all. People lie. (laughs) Well, people lie, but also- Or misperceive. They misperceive. And- Or, you know, who's to say it's misperceiving? There's just, everything's relative, right? If you're, I used to do triathlons very seriously. So if you were to ask me now, I feel like I'm totally inactive, right? Because I'm not doing anything near what I used to. And and if that's my focus set, (laughs) right, I feel like I'm not exercising much. But if I think about, you know, compared to other people, given what I know about, you know, national representative statistics, then I could feel like, oh, I'm getting a lot, right? So you can see how these perceptions are uh, decoupled from objective reality. And what we found in, in these studies is that that one question mattered, in some cases more than objective activity, but in all cases, controlling for objective activity and predicting death rates. And in some, in one of the samples, it was a 71% higher risk of death rate, uh, you know, if people rated themselves as feeling like they were getting less activity than others. Wow. So, that's yeah. A big, that's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. And again, you know, that study is cross-sectional, longitudinal. It was not experimental. Um, but you know, combined, you know, these really sort of, you know, coalesce to say, hey, this is important too, right? Like, let's figure out ways to be active and get people active, but let's also not make people feel horrible about themselves when they're not getting enough. And going back to the the hotel study, again, I mentioned that I did that at a time when I was a, I was a Division One ice hockey player at the time. We were training all the time, and I I was in an unhealthy mindset about that. I never felt like I was getting enough. I would, you know, come off a two-hour practice into a weightlifting session, and then I would get on the elliptical for 30 minutes because I thought I had to do that also. <laughs> you know, my, my teammates who were with me at the time could attest to that. And so that study was really helpful for me to realize that I needed to pay attention not just to what I was doing, but also take care of my mindset about that and... And, and I think the essence is how do you get people to feel like they're getting enough? It's a sense of enoughness that really matters. Yeah, I can see the dilemma because you, you don't want people thinking that um, that exercise and its positive effects are so potent that they can get away with a three-minute uh, walk each day and that they're, they're good right. because most likely they are not. Um, but again, you don't want to, them to be so back on their heels psychologically that they don't even do that or that they um, never exceed that by, by very much. But it seems like the, the message from the, the milkshake study and what we're talking about now in terms of exercise would be to really communicate to the general public that, that food has a potency, even healthy foods have a potency to give us energy, to fuel our uh, you know immune system and endocrine system, et cetera. And that exercise has a, a remarkable potency and that that potency can be enhanced yeah. by 
believing in or understanding that potency. Exactly. It would, is, it, is that an accurate way to state it? Total. Right. That's exactly right. And that's where I really feel like we need to push. And what I, I try to do in our research is to not just show, oh, mindset matters. Isn't that interesting? But it's it's both matter, right? Mm -hmm. Both exercise and what you think about it matter. Both what you eat and how you think about what you eat matter. And so we really, as individuals and as a society, need to work on yeah, what is the right way to cultivate both behaviors and mindsets about those behaviors that serve us? And in the food context, this, again, that milkshake study really changed me on a personal level because I had been somebody who was constantly trying, trying to restrain my eating, right? I, you know, I wanted to maintain or, you know, <laughs> lose weight, look fit. And so I felt, was like, well, I should diet. I should have low calorie, low carb, low this, low that. But what that was doing was putting me into this constant mindset of restraint. And what that study suggested was that that mindset was potentially counteracting any benefit, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. the, the, or any objective effects of the restrained diet. Because mm -hmm. my brain was saying, okay, you're restraining. Maybe my body was, you know, responding to that. But the brain was also saying, eat more food, <laughs> you know, stay hungry because right. you need to survive. And so the answer isn't, oh, we'll throw everything into the wind and just drink indulgent milkshakes all day long. The answer is eat healthy foods, right, <laughs> you know, based on the latest science and what we know to be true about nutrients and our body's response to them. But try to do so in a mindset of indulgence, a mindset of satisfaction, a mindset of enjoyment, right? That is really the trick. And that's what I at least try to do in, in my own life. I love that. And as I get more involved in the kind of public facing health communications, I this comes up again and again, you know, how, how should we conceptualize our behavior? How should we think about all these options that are offered to us? And I, I'm excited that the, um, the potency of mindsets are coming through again and again. So I have a question about this. I don't know if the, this study has ever been done, but uh, a lot of these mindset effects are something that years ago I felt I did vis-a-vis um, -vis sleep mm -hmm. because I was in graduate school and as a postdoc, and even as an undergraduate, I, I had so much work to do that I decided I would sleep when I was dead, in, in quotes. <laughs> Not a good idea uh, from what we know. However, I found that uh, a couple nights of minimal sleep or even an all-nighter, and I could do pretty well. Eventually, it would catch up with me. Has there ever been a study exploring whether or not the effects of sleep deprivation um, can be impacted by these mindset effects? Because uh, over the years, I keep learning more and more about how much sleep I need, and I've really emphasized sleep, and I do feel much better when I'm getting it. But as new parents know, or uh, students know, or athletes know, or anyone that lives a normal life finds sometimes that they don't get a good night's sleep. Would believing that we can tolerate that and push through it and function just fine and that it's not gonna kill us or give us Alzheimer's, um, uh, could that help us deal with a, with a poor night's sleep or even two or chronic sleep deprivation? Certainly, I would, I would guess. There's been one study, to my knowledge, that's tested that. Uh, Dragonaw and colleagues, and they looked at, they had people come in and they gave them sort of, a, I think it was a sham sort of EEG test to sort of figure out the how, you know, this was done a number of years ago. Now we actually have, you know, devices to test this, but theirs was this sham test. And then they gave people fake feedback about the quality of their sleep and, you know, how it had been the night before. And they also asked the the um, participants how they felt about their sleep. And um, essentially what they found was that the this sham feedback, if they were told that they had gotten let lower quality sleep, led to deficits in a variety of cognitive tasks. Um, and that was sort of decoupled from their actual, <laughs> you know, qualities of sleep, at least as self-reported. So that's one study that attests to this. I think certainly, I mean, I would, you know, I would bet a lot of money. I haven't run this myself, but that your mindsets can push around your, you know, cognitive functioning, physiological effects of sleep. But once again, it's it's not all or nothing, right? right? There are real important benefits of sleep and how far we can push around that through our mindset is an open question. Yeah, it, it, that 
the result that you mentioned is really interesting because a lot of people use these sleep trackers now. They're using rings or wristbands. In fact, my lab has worked pretty closely with a company. They supplied us data on how well people are sleeping. And you get a score. Uh, people get the score back. And when they see that score, they might think based on these results, oh, my sleep, my recovery score, my sleep score is poor. I'm, I shouldn't expect much from myself today. Or I, it makes sense that my memory would be going. Um, for this reason, and I'll probably lose a few friends for saying this, but hopefully I'll gain a few as well. That's why I like to just do a, a subjective um, score for myself. If I wake up in the morning, I just decide, okay, did I sleep well or not? I don't like seeing a number. Mm -hmm. I don't like getting a, a readout from a device. Um, that's me. I know a lot of people like it and they can be very useful, but uh, gosh, it seems that these belief effects are weaving in at all levels. Um, I'd love for us to talk about stress because um, your lab has worked extensively on this. And if you, if you would, could you tell us um, at some point about the study that you've done about informing people about the different effects of stress, um, but also uh, if there's an opportunity, some takeaways about how we could each conceptualize stress in ways that would make it um, serve us better yeah. as opposed to harm us and our mental and physical performance. Great. Yeah. So I had, you know, I'd come off the heels of doing some research in exercise uh, and diet and finding these provocative and also counterintuitive effects of, is with respect to like how we should try to motivate people. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I was, I was thinking about this and this, you know, grouping of going from, you know, medicines as to saving us to behaviors to saving us and how those behaviors might be influenced by mindsets. The obvious next thing to think about was stress, right? Because it's like, okay, well, you want to be healthier, fix your diet, fix your exercise and stress less. And, you know, so I started doing some digging into the nature of stress and, couple things were clear. One was that the public health message was very clear, right? That stress was bad, right? Unmitigated and harm, harmful on our health, our productivity, our relationships, our fertility, our cognition, you name it, right? Uh, the messages that were out there, by and large, oversimplified messages focused on the damaging consequences of stress. But as you know, if you actually dive deeper into the literature on stress and the origins of stress, what you find is that, you know, the literature, like most literature, is not so clear cut. And in fact, there's a large amount of evidence to support the fact that the experience of stress, meaning encountering adversity or challenge in one's goal-related efforts, uh, it does not have to be debilitating. And in many cases, the body's response was designed to enhance our ability to manage <laughs> at those moments, right? So some research showing that stress narrows our focus, increases our attention, speeds up the rate at which we're able to process information. There was some research out there showing this phenomenon of uh, physiological toughening, the process by which the release of catabolic hormones in the stress response, recruit or activate anabolic hormones, which help, as you know, build our muscles, build our you know, neurons to help us grow and learn. Uh, and there was a whole body of emerging research on uh, post-traumatic growth or this phenomenon in which even the experience of the most traumatic stressors, the most chronic and enduring stressors, could lead not to destruction, but in fact to the exact opposite, to an enhanced sense of connection with our values, connection to others, sense of um, joy and passion for living. And so, you know, I, I found that to be interesting. <laughs> and, you know, my work since then has been not to try to argue that stress is enhancing and not debilitating, but try to point out that the true nature of stress is a paradox. The true nature of stress is manifold and complex and lots of things can happen. But to question what's the role of our mindset about stress in shaping our response to stress. So some work had already been done looking at your perception of the stressor, right? So do you view a stressor like a challenging exam or a health diagnosis as a challenge or a threat? And that had shown pretty convincingly that when you view stressors more as a challenge, less as a threat, that your brain and body responds uh, more, more adaptively. 
What our question was was to take the sort of psychological construal one step higher in abstraction, so not just the stressor, but the nature of stress, right? Do you, you know, at, at that core level, do you view stress as something that's bad, is going to kill us, and therefore should be avoided? Or do you view some uh, stress as uh, natural and something that's going to enhance us? And so we set out to design a series of studies to test the extent to which these mindsets about stress mattered. Um, we first, this again was with uh, Peter Salovey and Sean Aker originally, we designed a measure to test people's mindsets about stress, simple questions like, what extent do you believe or agree or disagree with statements like, stress enhances my performance and productivity, <laughs> stress uh, um, heightens my vitality and growth, things like that. And we found in a number of correlational studies that that uh, more enhancing stress mindset was linked to uh, better health outcomes, uh, better well-being, and higher performance. So then we set out to see if we could change people's mindsets. And in our first test of this, we decided to do so by creating these multimedia films that showcased research, anecdotes, facts about stress, all true, but oriented towards one mindset or the other, right? So you can imagine one set of films showed basically the messages that were out there in the public health context. The other showed, hey, you know, stress is, you know, stress has been linked to these things, but in fact, the body stress response was designed to do this. Did you know it could do that? And we had um, empowering images like LeBron James making the free throw in the final minute versus missing it, right? <laughs> so all of these things are true, you know, possibilities, but oriented to two different mindsets about stress. So either people saw a video that basically made it seem like stress will diminish you, crush you, reduce you, yes. or a video very similar, stress will grow you, bring out your best, and maybe even take you to heightened levels of performance that you've never experienced before. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, examples in the sports, we also had like true leaders emerge in the moments of greatest stress, you know, Churchill. And so all those examples are out there for both the enhancing nature and the debilitating nature. And our question was, does orienting people to different mindsets change how they respond to stress? So this study was done in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. We worked with uh, UBS, a company, a financial service a company that was undergoing pretty massive amounts of layoffs. So these employees were stressed about being laid off. They were taking on more pressure. It was just a tough time. And we randomized them into three conditions. And this was all pre-work before getting a, a training on stress. Uh, but the three different conditions, some watched no videos, some watched the stress will crush you videos, and some watched the stress could enhance you videos. And what we found was that just, you know, it was a total of nine minutes of videos over the course of the week led to changes in their mindsets about stress, which led to changes in their um, physiological symptoms associated with stress. So people who watched the enhancing films had fewer backaches, muscle tension, insomnia, racing heart, and so forth. And they also reported uh, performing better at work compared to those who watched the debilitating videos. Now, interestingly, we didn't make anyone worse with the debilitating videos, well, that's which, good. Was, which was good. We had, we had good. told the, uh, the IRB we didn't expect that because that message was already out there. That's what they were already seeing. That wasn't new to them. Uh, it was more this enhancing perspective that turned out to be inspiring. I love that study. And I, I know we both have uh, friends and, and ties in the special operations community through just sort of happenstance and and we can maybe, maybe we'll get into that a little later but a, a good friend from that community uh, always says you know that there are only three ways to go through life at any moment which is either back on your heels flat footed or forward center of mass <laughs> and i said well well what's the key to forward center of mass and he said stress is what places you in forward center of mass meaning leaning forward and into challenge and i know that you've actually looked at that community and it does really seem like that's a mindset that either they have going in or that they cultivate through the course of their training. Um, but this notion that stress is what puts us in forward motion um, is true physiologically, right? I mean, adrenaline's mm -hmm. major role is to place us into a moment of, uh, or to bias us towards action. That's why we tremble. It's it, we're, 
the body trying to initiate action. But actually, uh, this is probably a good opportunity. If it was, if there's anything interesting to extract from the study on on um, seal teams, what what was it? Yeah, no, I loved working with with the seals. Um, one of the interesting things we found. So at the t- we had we've studied this you know, measured this mindset in several different populations. And in every single one that we had tested so far, the average had been on the debilitating side of the scale. People just saying stress is bad. Stress is bad, right? And, you know, you know, it's like with measures of uh, growth and fixed mindsets about intelligence, it tends, people are in the middle, but oftentimes have a more positive mindsets about intelligence. That was not the case with stress. It's still not the case. I'm trying to get the message out there, except for this group of Navy SEALs when they were actually uh, recruits, so people who were going through basic training in order to become Navy SEALs. And we found that they, on average, had a stress-enhancing mindset, perhaps not surprisingly, right? If you're going in to devote your whole life to (laughs) being a Navy SEAL, you must have some inclination that stress is a source of strength uh, for you. But what we found with them, we measured this at the beginning of their basic training, of BUDS training, and then looked at how well they succeeded through that program. So as you know, this is an extremely rigorous program. You know, at the time, it was only like 10 or 20% of um, Still is. trainees The numbers have never shifted from, yeah, from so, about that. No, no matter how hard... Uh, pressures on the community change that the numbers are still about on average about 15 percent yeah wow so what we found was that our measure predicted that rate so people who even within that range had a more stresses enhancing mindset were more likely to complete training become a seal they also had faster obstacle course times and they were rated by their peers more positively Uh, so you know again let's break this down right this doesn't mean and people get me People get this wrong sometimes. They think that I'm saying that a stress is enhancing mindset means you should like stress, right? Well, maybe SEALs do, but, <laughs> but that's not what we're saying, right? Having a stress is enhancing mindset doesn't mean the stressor is a good thing, right? It doesn't mean it's a good thing that you have to go into combat and it's not pretty, right? It doesn't mean that getting a, diagno- a cancer diagnosis is a good thing or being in abject poverty is a good thing. These are not good things. But the experience of the stress associated with that, the challenge, the adversity, that experience can lead to enhancing outcomes with respect to uh, not just our cognition, but our health, our performance, and our well-being. So that mindset, right, how does that work, right? Well, it works through a number of different pathways. One is that it changes fundamentally what we're motivated to do. So... If you, you know, just imagine we're stressed about something, maybe a global pandemic, for, for <laughs> example, instance. for instance, um, you know, and you think that stress is bad, then what's your motivation, right? Your motivation is to, well, first you get worried about the stress, right? Now, not only do you have the pandemic, you're stressed about the stress of the pandemic. But second is your reaction is typically to do one of two things. It's either to freak out and do everything you can to make sure that this doesn't affect you, you know, negatively, or to check out and say, oh, it's not a big deal, I'm not going to deal with it. I, you know, you're basically in denial. So people who have a stress is debilitating mindset, and we've shown this in our research, tend to go to one or the other of those extremes. They freak out or they check out. Why? Because if stress is bad, you need to either get rid of it and deal with it or, or it needs to not exist, right? If you have a stress is enhancing mindset, the motivation changes, right? Then the motivation is how do I utilize the stress to realize the enhancing outcomes? What can we do here, right, to learn from this experience to make us stronger, fitter, um, you know, have better science and treatments for the future, deepen my relationships with others, um, improve, you know, my priorities and so forth, right? So the the motivation changes, the affect around it changes. It doesn't make it easy to deal with, but what we've shown in our research is that people who have a stress is enhancing mindset have more positive affect, not necessarily less negative affect. Um, and it potentially changes physiology. We, we have a few studies that show that uh, people who are, um, you know, inspired to adopt more enhancing mindsets 
have more moderate cortisol response, and they have higher levels of DHEA levels um, in response to stress. So more work needs to be done on the physiology, but I'd love your take on yeah, I, <laughs> the mechanisms you, through which that's possible. Yes, and, and um, DHEA, of course, has an anabolic hormone in both men and women. Um, very interesting because uh, we had a guest on this podcast. Um, he actually is a he's a PhD scientist who runs the UFC um, Performance Training Institute. His name is Duncan French. And his graduate work at uh, UConn Stores was very interesting. It was in exercise science and physiology. What he showed was that um, if you could spike the adrenaline response, I think they did this through first time skydive or something mm. like that, that uh, testosterone went up. Mm. Now, this spits in the face of everything that we're told about stress and testosterone levels, right? Um, and this has also been looked at in females with estrogen, although uh, of course uh, there's estrogen and testosterone, both males and females, but that's how they designed the study. So it turns out that at least in the short term, that a very stressful event can raise anabolic hormones. Yeah. And I think that people forget at a mechanistic level that adrenaline is epinephrine and epinephrine is derived biochemically derived from the molecule dopamine. Mm. If you look at the pathway and you even just Google it and go images, you'll see that adrenaline is is made from dopamine. And dopamine and these anabolic hormones have a very close, they're sort of close cousins. They work together in the pituitary and hypothalamus. So it makes sense that uh, one could um, leverage stress toward growth right. um, and towards anabolism as opposed to cannibalism, which is not saying cannibalism as in eating other people, but catabol <laughs> catabolic processes is I guess the right way to refer to it. But what's again remarkable to me is that all of these brain structures that control dopamine, epinephrine, testosterone, and estrogen, they're all thought to be in the subconscious, meaning mm. below um, our, our ability to flip a switch and turn them on or off. Right. And yet mindset seemed to impact them. So I, I've, all that to say that there's a, a clear mechanistic basis by which this could all work. And, and so I'm, on the one hand, I'm surprised because they, these are incredible results. On the other hand, I'm not surprised because there's a physiological substrate there that could, that could readily explain them. Yeah, and I think I think figuring out exactly how it works is really, you know. <laughs> we should do that. We should do we that. Should collaborate. Let's do it. We've got common friends in both departments, so we should we should do it. Why but not? I, but I did want to mention, I you know the way, the way I think about mindset, and again, I think we need to uh, study this. I'm not a neuroscientist, so I haven't looked at this, but this is something we could do. But the way I think about mindset is that it's mindsets are kind of a portal between conscious and subconscious processes. They operate as a default setting of the mind, right? So if, you know, if sort of programmed in there, you have stress equals bad, right? That is going to you know, con that, that's going to be something maybe conscious, right? But it doesn't have to be conscious, right? You don't, people don't have to know their mindsets about stress until they're asked, really. It's, that's been programmed in through our upbringing, through public health messages and through media and other things. And it kind of sits there as an assumption in the brain. And the brain is then figuring out how should it respond to this situation? And if the assumption, the default, the programming is stress is bad, that's gonna, through our subconscious, trigger all the things that's like, okay, well, I need to like, <laughs> you know, rev up the things that protect me versus rev up the things that help me grow. And so that's at least how I think about it. And what's cool about it is that because it operates as a sort of portal, it communicates with more, you know, subconscious physiological processes, but it can also be accessed through our consciousness, right? So just talking about this, right, for your listeners, they're now invited to bring their stress mindsets up to the consciousness and say, what is my stress mindset? How do, am I thinking about stress? Can I reprogram that? Can I start to think about it as more enhancing? That takes a little bit of a con conscious work potentially, but then once you do that, it can that can kind of operate in, in the background, influencing how your body responds, and you don't have to say, "Okay, I'm stressed. I better tell my, you know, <laughs> anabolic hormones." To right. that, that doesn't right. work that way. No. Um, but these mindsets can help with the translational process. I love the idea that mindsets are at the interface between the conscious and subconscious, and um, I think there's there's a lot to unpack there, but. Um, 
it, it clearly is the case uh, that the mindset, they sort of act as heuristics, right? And, and, and as we talked about earlier, they can limit what the number of things to focus on because one thing that is really stressful is trying to focus on everything all the time. I mean, trying to navigate the public health around anything, the public health information around anything is kind of overwhelming. As you mentioned for stress, you see a lot and the stresses will crush you. And then you can also find evidence that stress will grow you. Mm -hmm. How should uh, we, the listeners, think about stress? I mean, what, what's the most adaptive way to think about stress? Mm -hmm. uh, and should we talk about our stress? Should we not talk about our stress? Um, is there a, a short list of, of ways that we can cope with stress better? Yeah. Or uh, may, I should be careful with the word cope. Is there a way that we can <laughs> leverage stress to our advantage? Great. Yeah, and that's an important, important nuance in your language, which is uh, people of by and large, come from a place of how do you manage stress? How do you cope with it? Which implies how do you fight against it? Vacation, right? fight massages, against it. <laughs> yoga yeah. classes. Or and, yeah. Fight against it oh, or right. check out exactly. from it, right? Exactly. And yeah, the real challenge is how do we leverage it? How do we utilize it? How do we work with it? And yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. The first and most, most important thing is to clarify our definition of stress. So I think people often associate the, the stress mind, negative stress mindset is so insidious that now people define stress with its negative consequences. So the first step is to decouple that and to realize that stress is a neutral, <laughs> right, yet to be determined effect of experiencing or anticipating adversity in your goal-related efforts. So let me unpack that a little more. You can be in the midst of it, or you could just be worried about something happening. That's one aspect. Second is adversity or challenge, so something that's working against you. But the third piece is critical, and that is in your goal-related efforts. What that means is that we only stress about things we care about, things that matter to us. So this is really important, right? Because stress is linked with, it's the other side of the coin of things we care about, right? And so I think that's the first thing to realize, right? That as humans, we stress because we care and we don't stress about things we don't care about. So the simplified example I like to use is, you know, if Johnny was failing school, that wouldn't stress you out unless Johnny was your son or you were Johnny or you really cared about the educating the Johnnies of the world, right? It only becomes stressful to the extent that you care about it. So why are we trying to fight or run away or hide or merely cope with our stress or, you know, overcome it through our massages when the stress is connected to the things we care about? So then the question becomes, okay, if that's true, how can I better utilize or leverage or respond to the inevitable stresses that we're going to experience? I'm not saying go out and seek out more stress. What I am saying is that you're gonna experience stress if you have any cares or values or passions, and most all of us do. Um, and so then what do you do? And we've developed a three-step approach to adopting a stresses-enhancing mindset. And briefly, it's the first step is to just acknowledge that you're stressed, to own it, see it, uh, be mindful of it. The second step is to welcome it. Uh, why would you welcome it? You welcome it because inherently in that stress is something you care about. So you're using it as an opportunity to reconnect to what is it that I care about here? And then the third step is to utilize the stress response to achieve the thing you care about, not spend your time, money, effort, energy trying to get rid of the stress. Does that make sense? Makes can... sense. <laughs> and, I, and I love it. As somebody whose laboratory studies the physiological effects of stress, the, the effects that impress me the most are, for instance, the narrowing of visual attention that it then um, drives a capacity to parse time more finely, which then drives a capacity to process information faster. It's, it's almost like a superpower. Right. Uh, and yes, it can feel uncomfortable often, mm -hmm. um, but I love the idea that um, acknowledging it, um, embracing it, 
yeah. and then understanding its power and leveraging that power, uh, I think is in, it, what I like so much about that framework is that the stress response is very generic. We, unlike the relaxation response, we don't actually have to train up the stress response. Right. So we all kind of get this as a, as a freebie. And then it sounds like it's a question of what we end up doing with that. Right. And Hans Selye, father of stress, said himself, it's a nonspecific response, right? So it's, it, it occurs. It's what you're doing with it. It's how you're channeling it. And yeah, like we talked about before, what most people do is they stress about the stress, <laughs> which then over exacerbates it, or they check out from the stress, which leads to depression and anhedonia because by checking out from stress, you're also checking out from the things we care about. And substance abuse. Exactly. Our colleague, yeah. Anna Lemke, who also uh, we had the good fortune of having as a guest on this podcast, talked a lot about th this, that, you know, I mean, so much of substance abuse, it, it, because she runs the addiction clinic over on the med side of campus, um, it, it takes over people's lives because of this increased ability to, to find a solution to the stress that then eventually becomes its own stressor and its own problem. Um, well, I, I, I love that, that, that mindset and framework. I'd love for you to um, tell us just a bit about what you're up to right now and what's most exciting to you now. If you um, are able or willing to talk about some of the, the work that's on the way, I saw a brief mention of something on your uh, publications website of a, of a paper about influencers, uh, online influencers and nutrition. Uh, that might not be the main thrust of what you're up to, but if you're able to tell us about it, sort of interesting given that uh, a lot of the communication in and around this podcast takes place through social media. And I've been kind of launched into this uh, landscape now where I, I'm constantly bombarded with health information mm. and um, and influencers, mm -hmm. a, a term I didn't even know until a couple of couple <laughs> You couple, are one. Well, well, one could argue uh, <laughs> one way or the other, but um, the... So what it, what is the deal with influencers? Are they doing something good for health information, or are they ruin, are they ruining the landscape? Uh, and and don't, don't try and protect my feelings because no, yeah. I now know that stress is is actually an asset. So. Yes, well, I you know that work is part of a body of work that we've been sort of venturing into, which is to understand where do these mindsets come from, right? And I mentioned sort of public health entities as one source of say, our mindsets about stress. But I think that our mindsets are influenced by four different sources. Uh, first is our upbringing, how our parents talked about, you know, things like when we're stressed or food or other things. Uh, second is culture and media. So movies, um, you know, podcasts, now, and now social media. Uh, third uh, is influential others, so what doctors say to us or close friends or peers. And fourth is your conscious choice. So, you know, we, we talked about that a little. You do have, uh, we have, as humans, have the ability to be mindful of and to change our mindsets. Uh, but, you know, the social media and influencer stuff has been in part an attempt to understand where do our mindsets about things like healthy foods come from. And Brad Turnwald, who is a former grad student in my lab, has done a series of really interesting studies on this showing that, you know, if you rate the nutritional quality of the, you know, top grossing uh, movies in the last 20 years, or you look at the Instagram accounts of all the most influential people on uh, Instagram, what you and you analyze the nutrition content of what they're eating, uh, what he's shown is that, you know, depending on the study, 70 to 90 percent of those movies or influencers would fail the legal standards for uh, advertising in the UK. So <laughs> they're putting out their nutrition contents that are, you know, maybe not surprisingly, but undeniably unhealthy. And, you know, to me, that's interesting and important. It shows that where are, kid, where are we getting this mindset that, you know, those unhealthy foods are pleasurable, desirable. What's maybe even more interesting than that is some of the work that he and others in our lab have done to show that the ways people are talking about the foods they're eating really matter too. So generally what we found is that when people talk about unhealthy foods, they use 
uh, language that connotes a sense of excitement, fun, sexiness, danger, indulgence, basically anything good and desirable. This, right? this would be like cookies, um, cakes, high sugar, high, sorry, just yeah, really sorry. unhealthy. Like truly food. unhealthy yeah. foods okay. or, like, yeah, that's... Actually, the objective, <laughs> what health means is challenging, but yeah, high fat, high yeah. sugar. I think food. there's pretty good agreement now that excessive sugar yeah. isn't good. And highly processed. Yeah, highly uh, processed excessive sugar. I think there's general consensus. I'm sure someone, will, if you're going to come after anyone, come after me. I'll stand behind that statement. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, when people are talking about if they do, which, you know, healthy foods aren't portrayed in media, they aren't portrayed by influencers, Rarely ever. And when they are, they're often talked about with language that conveys a sense of deprivation. It's, you know, it's nutritious, but it's, it's sort of boring. It's bland. It's Recovery less tasty. Recovery from the holidays. It's, sort <laughs> yeah. of the post-holiday exactly. reset. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is really important because, you know, you're doing all this work trying, you know, and others are doing all this work trying to inform people about what actually is good for them. And meanwhile, there's this, you know, hurricane of other, fo you know, a force that's telling people, that's seeping into our minds that, Sure, those might be good for you, but those foods are not fun or sexy or indulgent or desirable in any way, shape, or form, right? And it's it's also uh, paid advertising for fast foods and sugary beverages and other things. So it's not surprising that we have this mindset that healthy foods are the less desirable thing to eat because of those cultural and social forces. Uh, what our work has just tried to do is to reveal that, you know, quantify it as a way to say, all right, let's maybe be a little bit more mindful about how we talk about healthy foods. And could, you know, if you're a movie producer, can you be a little bit more mindful to showcase healthy and delicious foods and have the characters talk about them in ways that are more appealing? Uh, there's a lot of uh, room for people who produce this content to have an impact, not just on, you know, what people do, but what they think about the foods they're eating. It's really interesting. I hadn't um, thought about it until now, but it makes sense that any food that's packaged and can be sold is can be woven into a, a film or um, promoted by a, a celebrity influencer, not a health influencer per se, but a celebrity influencer because they'll get paid, right? It's part of the, the ecosystem that allows them an income and it feeds back on sales to the company. And uh, whereas it, uh, things that can't be commoditized, it's it's more difficult, right? It's hard to, um, the, whoever makes oranges and sells oranges is not, unlikely to promote oranges in a, in a celebrity post or in a movie because oranges can be purchased from many, many right. sources. There's no identifiable source of, of oranges as there is with a packaged food, for instance. Yeah, but the, the interesting thing we found in those studies is that it wasn't driven by promoted content or branded content. There's some of that, certainly. And yeah, all of the promoted and branded con content is usually for processed high sugar foods. But 90% or more of these foods that they were showing were not promoted or branded. And so there's uh, a lot of flexibility in what you know, these producers or influencers could show <laughs> on their media. Although it, it goes both ways, right? It's not just the producers and the influencers' responsibility. Uh, the public is reacting to this. And, and we showed, too, that uh, people respond more positively. There are more likes on posts about unhealthy foods. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a sort of a distasteful <laughs> and in that, you know, it's a distasteful culture around healthy eating. And we really have a lot to do to change it. Yeah, well, it's dopamine circuits through and through. Yeah. Just the, the sight of some exactly. uh, very calorie dense, extremely tasty food um, drives those dopamine circuits. You know, um, and, for, and I realize that there are people out there who derive the same sort of or similar levels of, of pleasure from healthy foods. And that's a wonderful thing if one can accomplish that. So we just need more of that is what it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's really inspiring to me, at least, is that it is possible, right? I mean, people think, oh, well, vegetables are just inherently less tasty than ice cream. And it's like, well, that's not necessarily true. Also, it doesn't have to be a competition, right? I don't have to get my three-year-old to hate ice cream in order for her to like 
broccoli. There's a lot more I can be doing to help shape a more positive, approach-oriented, indulgent mindset around healthy, nutritious vegetables and fruits and other foods, right? In addition to having her like ice cream, right? And that's totally fine. Sounds like a really interesting study. When it's published, please let me know. And I'll, yeah, I think I'll, it was actually released this week. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. I will be sure and to- JAMA Internal Medicine. JAMA Internal, okay. Um, great journal. I will definitely um, talk about it on social media and, um, and elsewhere. Uh, sounds very interesting. What else are you up to lately? That's uh, I, my favorite question to ask any scientist or colleague. By the way, is what are you most excited <laughs> about lately? Um, what 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 are you up late thinking about and getting up early thinking about? Yeah. So hands down, the thing I'm most excited. Well, I guess there's so many things. The thing that I'm most into right now, we're doing the most work in, is you know I started by getting inspired by placebo effects in medicine. I did a long stint in placebo or belief-like effects in behavioral health, and now we're moving back into medicine. Uh, so I'm really interested in looking at how we can work with active drugs and treatments to make them better and make the experience of them better by instilling different mindsets. Uh, so one study we did along those lines, we worked with uh, kids are undergoing treatment for food allergies, so allergies to peanuts, for example. This was with Kari Nado, who's the head of the Stanford Allergy Center here. She has a great treatment for food allergies. Basically, kids take gradually increasing doses of the thing they're allergic to, like peanuts. And over the course of six or seven months, these kids become, you know, less reactive to peanuts. And the problem with that treatment is it's really uh, difficult because they're having all sorts of negative symptoms and side effects. These kids are getting itch itchy mouths and upset stomach. They're puking, and it's scary because they're literally eating the thing that they've been told might kill them, right? And what we did in the study was we attempted to improve the experience and outcomes of that by reframing uh, mindsets about the symptoms and the side effects. So as it was being conducted before, the kids were told, look, these side effects are just an unfortunate byproduct of this treatment. And you have to sort of endure them to get through it. But what we found in our conversation with Kari was that the reality of those side effects was not so negative. In fact, they were uh, mechanistically linked to the body learning how to tolerate <laughs> peanuts or the allergen. And so what we did was we worked within a trial. They were all getting the treatment, but half of them were uh, helped to see this more positive mindsets, that symptoms and side effects from this treatment were a positive signal that the treatment was working and their bodies were getting stronger. And what we found was that that mindset led to reductions in anxiety, uh, fewer symptoms when at the highest doses, and most interestingly of all, they had better outcomes. So based on immune markers that were a sign of the allergic tolerance, those who had this mindset throughout had better outcomes to the treatment. So that's just one example. I think, you know, my goal is really to move us beyond the placebo versus drug, you know, mindset versus behavior to get to a place where we can blend them together and maximize the benefit of these treatments. So we're doing a lot of studies like that, you know, how can we improve treatment for cancer with different mindsets. We've done some work recently with the COVID-19 vaccine um, and symptoms and side effects. So that's what I'm really passionate about right now. Incredible. Um, I can't wait to read that study. Is that one out or yes. uh, on the way? Okay, mm -hmm. well then I, I will also read and communicate with you and then about that study. Who knows, maybe you would come on Instagram and do a little Instagram live um, sure. to make sure that uh, I don't screw up the delivery and that uh, <laughs> we can hear it direct from the person who ran the study. I, I find this issue of side effects really interesting. Um, I don't take a lot of prescription drugs, but recently I was prescribed a few and the list of side effects is, you know, uh, it's incredible. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I realize some of that is legal protections. Mm -hmm. I, it's hard for me to believe that they're actually expecting anyone to read those because you need a, a you know, a high-powered microscope to read this print. is truly fine print. But I did realize that in reading over the side effects that you, you 
prime, one primes themselves to experience those side effects. Mm -hmm. And so now I just rip up the side effects thing and, or the, the sheet and just throw it away. I just take it as recommended. Do you think it works in the other direction too? Where if an effective medication is uh, supposed to have result A, B, or C, and you are told again and again how effective it is for that treatment, that it could amplify the effect. So it, in other mm -hmm. words, it's not a, it's, it's strictly a placebo. Right. It's not nocebo, as you described before, but that perhaps at a lower dose, a, a given medication could have a amplified effect or at a, at a appropriate dose, if you will, it could have a super physiological mm -hmm. effect. Has that ever been demonstrated? Um, to some degree, I think where it gets tricky is for a long time, people thought the effects of placebos were expectancy based. So you expect to get a benefit and that benefit occurs. There, there's certainly some some truth to that, but I think the mindset approach is more powerful because it helps us understand the mechanisms, right? So if if you just expect that your blood pressure will go down, that you know what are the mechanisms through which that expectation would lead to your blood pressure going down? It's hard to even understand that, right? But if you have the mindset that you're in good hands that this is being taken care of, that this is not, this illness is not going to kill you, right? That you're being treated well. Then you can start to unpack, you know, the mechanisms through which blood pressure could be relieved. Maybe it's anxiety reduction. Maybe it's changing the, you know, the sort of anticipation of what, or the prioritization of what the body needs to focus on. And so I really think that you know, the work of the future needs to be on getting more sophisticated about what is the mindset that we're instilling when we say something will work or it won't work? And how do we understand the mechanisms through which that changes physiology? So I, to answer your question, I think that that could be true, but it depends on what actually is the mindset you're evoking. I know you're uh, a parent and <laughs> to the other parents out there, but also to kids and people who don't have kids, what is the best way to learn and teach mindsets? I mean, clearly a conversation like this informs me and um, many other people out there about mindsets and how we can adopt them. But it also seems to me that if we have the opportunity to teach mindsets and really cultivate certain mindsets, that the world would be a much better place. Yes. How does one go about that? Given that there we're kids and we are all being bombarded with conflicting information all the time, how do we anchor to a mindset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're getting at my other major passion <laughs> right now, which is what we're calling in our lab meta mindset. I'm working on this with Chris Evans and others. And that is how do we consciously and deliberately change our mindsets? And the first step is really simple, and that's just to be aware that you have them, that the world, your beliefs aren't sort of an unmitigated reflection of reality as it objectively is. They are filtered through our interpretations, our expectations, our frameworks and simplifications of that reality. And as, you know, your work and your as you know so well, all of most of what goes on in our brain is an interpretation <laughs> of reality. Mindsets are just the simplified core assumptions about things. And the first step is to realize that we have them. The second step is to start to think about what the effects of those mindsets are on your life to sort of play out the story, right? Okay, I have this mindset that stress is debilitating. How is that making me feel? What is that leading me to do? Is this mindset helpful or harmful? The question isn't, is the mindset right or wrong? Because you can find evidence for or against it, you know, and we can fight about it till we're, you know, exhausted. The question is, is it helpful or harmful? And then, you know, you can go about seeking out ways to adopt more useful mindsets. Um, so, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on how to actually do that. How do you consciously change it? Sometimes it's really simple. I think in cases where we don't have a lot of prior experience, like the, the kids with um, allergies who are getting treatment, they, they didn't have any other mindsets about symptoms. So we just had the luxury of setting it, <laughs> right? 
when it comes to healthy food, I think we have a, it's harder to change people's mindsets because we have a lot of baggage weighing us down. Um, as a parent, for me, I guess my number one piece of advice is to lighten up trying to get your kids to do certain things and focus more on helping them to adopt more adaptive mindsets. So, you know, I'm by no means an expert at this, but I'm testing it with my own child. In real time. In <laughs> real time. time. The, the real kind of experiment. <laughs> yeah. It's how do I, you know, how do I resist the urge to force my child to eat her dinner so that she can have her dessert, right? Because that's the real urge. It's like, no, you need to do that. Negotiating. Because that, when you start thinking about it in terms of mindset, you realize, oh, that's just reinforcing to her that the dessert is the exciting, fun thing to have. And this thing that I have to do must be horrible, so horrible that my, you know, my parent is forcing me to do it, right? So it's letting go a little bit of the behavior, the objective reality, and really thinking about the subjective reality and focusing on adaptive mindsets. Uh, so my goal as a parent has been to try to help her instill a healthy mindset uh, about eating, that healthy foods are indulgent and delicious, that the experience of stress is inevitable, that it's, it, it's natural, and that it can help, going through stressful experience can help her learn, grow, and become a more connected and happier individual. And, you know, with exercise and physical activity, we haven't really gotten to that yet, but <laughs> we will with time. Yeah. It's great. I, I wrote down, and I'm going to keep this in the front of my mind going forward, um, to continually ask, what is the effect of my mindset about X? And just to evaluate that about exercise, about food, about school, about stress, about relationships, about relationship to self, et cetera. And to really um, think about that in a series of layers. So you think that would be a useful exercise? Definitely. And, I, and you know, and your work speaks to this. I mean, the mindful, it, it's not, I would, yeah, really urge against people getting dogmatic about their mindset also, right? Like, oh, I need to have the right mindset. Or, and if I don't have the right mind, you know, it's like, okay, mindset is a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of the puzzle that's really empowering because we have access to it and we can change it. But it is just one piece of a puzzle. So treat yourself like a scientist. Look at your life. Look at your mindsets. See what's serving you. See what isn't. Find more useful, adaptive, and empowering mindsets and and live by those. I love it. Now, in one version of this kind of discussion, I would have asked the question I'm going to ask next at the beginning, but I'm <laughs> going to ask it uh, now close to the end, which is you're a unique constellation of um, accomplishments and, and attributes. And I only know a subset of them, of course, because uh, today's the first time that we've met in person, even though I've known your work for a long time and we're colleagues across campus. So you, you run your laboratory. Uh, where you do uh, research. You were also an athlete in university, a serious athlete. And then you're also a clinical psychologist. Is that right? So I was trained as a clinical psychologist. Okay. So my PhD is in clinical psychology. And I did, you know, all my uh, pre and post internships uh, with stress and trauma. Do you see patients or did you see patients I at did. that time? Yes, I don't okay. anymore. Okay. That's a very unique constellation of practitioner and researcher. Um, so what, what are the mindsets that you try and adopt, uh, on a regular basis in, uh, as a consequence or in relation to those things, sort of athlete, researcher, clinician, you know, for yourself, as you move through life, do you have an overarching mindset, um, that all challenge is good? Um, or do you have any kind of, um, central mindsets that help you navigate through, you know, it has to be a pretty complex set of, of daily routines given everything that you juggle. But I think that people like you are, are unique in, in that you have the, you have the inside knowledge of, of how this stuff works. And you've also existed in these different domains. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of listeners have a more athletic um, uh, slant to their life or a more uh, cognitive or some are raising kids or some people are just, you know, it, are doing any number of things. So this is where I think it would be useful for people to hear. Kind of what, what do you do? This is what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, certainly true in my case that research is me-search. Right? <laughs> Everything that I study as an intellectual has come from my own experience or my own failings, right? And when I was, you know, 
really intensely exercising and training, those were the questions I asked when I was dealing with eating and, you know, concerns about my weight. Those were the questions I asked when I was stressed about my dissertation. I decided to do my dissertation on stress, right? You know, now I think we're in the midst of a global pandemic. It's, you know, wh- how can our mindsets be useful here? You know, so I, you know, I don't think there's a obvious answer to your question other than the guiding light for me has been an undercurrent of understanding that our mindsets matter. I think I got that very clearly and deeply as a child, both through my experiences as an athlete. You know, I know many of your listeners are athletes. Any athlete knows that you can be the same physical being from one day to the next, one moment to the next, and perform completely differently just depending on what you're thinking. I was a gymnast growing up, and if you can't visualize, if you can't see something in your mind, you have no chance when you get up there on the balance beam, right? And I also, my father was a martial artist, a teacher of meditation, so (laughs) this kind of mind-body work was baked into me from an early age. And I think what I've done recently is to try to understand it scientifically and more importantly, to figure out how can we how can we do better with this, right? How can we, you know, we're all talking about AI taking over the world and technology this and all the personalized medicine that. And it's like, we have done so little, relatively so little with the human resource, our human brains, that the, you know, the the potential for which is so great. And we've done almost nothing. You know, take the placebo effect. We know a lot about what it is. We've done almost nothing to leverage that in medicine, consciously and deliberately. So my, what keeps me going, what gets me through the hard times is just that burning question of what is going on here and what more can I do with the power of my mind? Well, I and millions of other people are so grateful that you do this work. It's so important and it's truly unique. Tell us where people can learn more about your research, where they can find you online. I'm going to try and persuade you to take more of a uh, social media presence um, going forward, but whether or not I succeed in that effort or not, uh, where can people find you, um, ask questions, find your papers, learn more? Um, I'd love to have you back for a conversation in the future, but in the meantime. Yeah, no, it's really, it's been such an honor getting to chat with you and just, you, you have such an impact on the world and I look forward. I hope we can do some science together Absolutely. also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, all our papers and uh, materials and interventions are housed on our website, uh, mbl.stanford.edu. Uh, we also have a link there to, that takes you to Stanford Spark, which stands for Social Psychological Answers to Real World Questions. And we have a lot of toolkits on that website, uh, including a toolkit for this rethink stress approach of acknowledging, welcoming, and utilizing your stress. And then um, I guess I'm on Twitter, Alia Krum. <laughs> I don't do much there, but maybe I will start to. Well, those are all great resources. We will provide links to all of those for our listeners and viewers. And um, I also hope to to convince you to write a book or many books (laughs) in the future. Uh, The world needs to know about this. But thank you so much for taking time out of your exceedingly busy schedule to talk to us about these ideas. I learned so much. I'm going to definitely think about what is the effect of my mindset about blank (laughs) in uh, every category of life. And and really just on behalf of of everybody and, and myself, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I guess I just want to end by saying, I think, this work is really the tip of the iceberg of what can and should be done. And so I really invite your, you, your listeners and all, you know, anybody who's inspired by this work, if they want to share stories or uh, want to partner on a collaboration to please reach out. Great. Well, and the comment section on YouTube is a great place to do that as well. Um, you will hear from them. Great. <laughs> right. great. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for my conversation with Dr. Aliyah Crum. I'm guessing by now you can appreciate the enormous impact that mindsets have on our biology and our psychology and how those interact at the level of mind and body. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Crum's work and perhaps even be a research subject in one of their upcoming studies on mindsets, you can go to mbl.stanford.edu. 
There you will also see a tab for support where if you like, you can make a tax deductible donation to support the incredible research that Dr. Crum and her colleagues are doing. If you're learning from and or enjoying the Huberman Lab podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify. And on Apple, you have the opportunity to leave us up to a five-star review. On YouTube, you also have the opportunity to leave us questions and comments in the comment section below any of the episodes. You can also make suggestions about future guests that you'd like us to host on the Huberman Lab podcast. Please also check out our sponsors mentioned at the beginning of this episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. We also have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Andrew Huberman. And there you can support the podcast at any level that you like. If you're not already following us on Instagram and on Twitter, we are Huberman Lab at both Instagram and Twitter. And there I teach neuroscience in short form, sometimes videos, sometimes text slides. Some of that information overlaps with what you find on the podcast. Some of it is distinct from what you find on the podcast. On previous episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, I often discuss supplements. While supplements aren't necessary or used by everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them. An important consideration when using supplements is that they be sourced from the highest quality sources. For that reason, we partner with Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E, because Thorne supplements use the highest quality ingredients and the greatest degree of precision in terms of what's listed on the bottle is actually what you will find in their products. And that is not true for all supplement companies. If you'd like to see the supplements that I take, you can go to Thorne, that's T-H-O-R-N-E dot com slash the letter U slash Huberman, and you can get 20% off any of those supplements. In addition, if you navigate into the Thorne site through that portal, thorne.com slash U slash Huberman, you can also get 20% off any of the other supplements that Thorne makes. In closing, I'd like to thank you once again for joining me for my discussion about mindsets with Dr. Aaliyah Crum. And as always, thank you for your interest in science.